today, for today is the day the Lord has made. I'll be reading chapters 47 and 48 from the book of Psalms, King James Version, the Expository Study Bible, so the notes will be included. As always, we ask God in the mighty name of Jesus to bless us with the revelation of this word so we can grow in the knowledge and grace of Jesus Christ and them crucified and that the blessed word will be hidden in our hearts. Remember, the word of God is the most precious thing on earth and it is an absolute blessing. Nothing better you could do with your time than reading that word of God. All right. So. You know. Today is the day that the Lord has made. And today's evil is sufficient for today, says God. Each day we are blessed to live. The world, the flesh, the devil have one goal. Each day you live. And that is to have you remove your faith from Jesus and him crucified into something or someone else. And when you do that, their number one goal becomes for you to die. And tragically, this happens to millions and millions of people. So the Bible says we only have one fight. We fight. And that is the fight to keep our faith in Jesus Christ and crucified. Everything else, every other fight, God, it's in his hands. But the fight to keep our faith in Jesus, that's our fight. So, today is the day. Forget about tomorrow. Forget about next week, next month, next year. Forget about yesterday. Today is to, Today is the day. If you're not saved, come to the Lord today. You haven't repented, repent to the Lord today. You haven't been reading that Bible, read that word today. You haven't been praying, pray today. You haven't given him thanks or praise or worship, do it today. Today is the day. All right, 47. It is believed it may have been written by either Hezekiah or Isaiah. God reigns over all the earth. And once again, as always, doesn't matter whose hand wrote it. We know it's God who gave the word. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with one voice of triumph. This is the only place in the Bible that commands us to clap our hands, respecting praise to God. Other places in the Bible allude to it. If it was written by Hezekiah or Isaiah, it was during the time immediately following the great victory over Sennacherib, brought about entirely by the Lord. It is a time of praise. For the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. Sennacherib had made his boast, and now the Holy Spirit through the people of Jerusalem makes his boast, which proclaims the Lord Most High as king over all the earth. And I can't wait for this. I cannot wait. You know, God's been merciful, long-suffering, and I thank him for it. Because without that, I'd be doomed for a lick of fire. But the day is going to come where it's going to be no more mercy, no more long-suffering, no more allowing abominations and sin and blasphemies in religion it's all going to come to an end and never be again. Thank God. Three, he shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He has and he will. He shall choose our inheritance for us. The excellency of Jacob, who he loved, Selah. The excellency of Jacob means the supremacy of Jacob over the nations, which will take place in the condom, coming kingdom age. So once again, Israel is going to be the greatest place on planet earth. It's going to happen. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. 
Even though it speaks of the victory over the Syrians, it also speaks of the great victory yet to come over the Antichrist, which will take place at the second coming. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto our King. Sing praises. <clears throat> That's a little, let me read that again. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto our King. Sing praises. Praise God. That's a lot of praising, isn't it? Praise God. The closer to God that one gets, the more song of praises becomes prominent. That is true. The more hunger and thirst we have for the Lord, the closer we draw, then the more we'll find ourselves giving him praise and thanks. I want you to honestly answer this question. How much do you actually think about the Lord? How much do you praise him, thank him, worship him, read his word? How often do you meditate on him? How much during the day? The closer you get to him, the more you hunger and thirst for him, you'll notice that you're basically constantly with thoughts of him. It'd be hard for you to find a certain length of time where you didn't give a thought about Jesus. So that's just another sign to yourself about how much you hurt about about how much you hunger and thirst for the Lord. All right, seven, four, God is the king of all the earth. Sing you praises with understanding. The Holy Spirit is saying that we should have understanding regarding this matter. Jesus Christ is king of all the earth and not the Antichrist. Yes, understand that. You should definitely understand that. Who is the king of kings? God reigns over all the heathen. God sits upon the throne of his holiness. In the coming... In the coming millennial reign, the Lord of glory will reign over the entirety of the earth and will do so personally from Jerusalem. And what what a day it will be. Do you not know that Jesus is coming back and he's coming back, back with power and glory? He's not coming back to get spit on or to get slapped or to get crucified. He's not here to be lied about, spit on. No, no, no. He's coming back with power and glory. There there will be no mercy. None. He's coming back with power and glory. He's going to tell you how it's going to be, and it's going to be that way. Period. There is no option. Differently. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. This pertains to the great victory of the Lord defeating the army of the Assyrians in one night with, with one angel. In a greater sense, it speaks of the tremendous victory of the Lord Jesus Christ over the Antichrist, which of course is yet future. But as surely as the previous victory took place, as surely will this victory t- take place. Um, so if you never read the scripture where God sent one angel to take out a whole army, um, find that in Second Kings and Isaiah thirty-seven, thirty-six, and 2 Kings nineteen thirty-five. Um, all right, chapter forty-eight as well. This psalm could have been written by either Isaiah or Hezekiah. Zion, the city of the great king. Once again, doesn't matter whose hand actually wrote it. It's God who gave the word. So that that's that's all that matters. I don't care whose hand wrote it. I know God is the one who gave the word. So that's all you need to know. Um, Oh, another air right here. Great OS. You know, um, spell checking, grammar checking. When you have the Bible, you're talking. God only knows how many words are in this. But sometimes you're going to have mistakes. So... Maybe they can do an update when they find mistakes, but obviously this is great. Is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God and the mountain of his holiness. The celebration over the Syrians continues as well. These same passages speak in prophetic tones 
of the coming victory over the Antichrist, as stated as surely as the previous, most definitely will be the future. If you've been reading along, you're familiar with things happening not only are present things at the time of this, but also future at the same time. So something that can happen thousands of years ago can also be something foreshadowing what will come thousands of years later. So if you're familiar with the Bible, you'll know this happens quite a bit, where something thousands of years ago could happen, but yet it pertains to what will happen thousands of, thousands of years later. So that's, that's typical in the Bible. Uh, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. On the sides of the north, the city of the great king. And Jerusalem is situated in the exact geographical center of the earth. In the com coming kingdom age, Jerusalem will be what God has always intended, the joy of the whole earth. So maybe we didn't we didn't know this, huh? That it's it's in the center of the earth, Jerusalem. So once again, we will see once again the real size of Israel when Jesus comes back. Um, once again, I have to get a picture. And put it on, I'll make a video. I think I might have put a video already out there. I, I have to look. But there is a little map showing you the real size of Israel. It is, it's pretty big. <laughs> Way bigger than you would think. The real size of it, of course. Um, and also, um, during this time, when Jesus comes back, after the second coming, after the Antichrist is defeated and thrown in hell, I mean, a lake of fire, I mean, and, and all the demons are thrown in a lake of fire. It's all said and done. It's over. Um, the earth will be redone. So the earth will be set, will be set on fire and be revamped. So no oceans, no seas, no mountains, no deserts. The entirety of the earth will be farmable land. And there will be rivers. The entire earth. I want you to think about that. Try to imagine this planet where there is no ocean. There's no sea. There's no deserts. There's no mountains. It's all farmable land. You know how much room there would be on planet earth? If you got rid of the deserts, if you made the deserts alone farmable land, you know how much room there would be on this planet. If you got rid of the seas, you know how much room there would be? The oceans? Look at a map. I want you to look at a map and look at how much room you would gain on this planet if you were to get rid of the oceans, seas, deserts, in mountains, there's going to be plenty of room on this planet when it's redone. All right. Three. God is known in her places for a refuge. In the great cities and the governmental centers of the world, men are known. But in this great city and palace, God will be known. For lo, the kings were assembled, they passed by together. This speaks of the kings of the earth during Hezekiah's day who was similar to destroy Jerusalem. They fell they felt they could not lose, but they but lose they did. It will be the same during the days of the Antichrist. They saw it, and so they marveled. They were troubled and hasted away. Why did they run? They ran because of the Lord. With one angel one night killed one hundred and eighty five thousand Assyrians, completely decimating their army. Once again, 2 Kings 19.35, Isaiah 37.36. So, one angel killed 185,000 Assyrians in one night. <laughs> I, I, I laugh because <laughs> God is God. There is no equal. There's no one above. There's no one close. God can do anything. Okay, 
All right, six. Fear took hold upon them there in pain as a, a woman in travail. And no wonder, for the first time in the history, they came up against the glory, the, the God of glory. You break the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. If Hezekiah wrote this psalm, he probably little understood the full meaning of this verse given to him by the Holy Spirit. This greater fulfillment will be at the Battle of Armageddon, when Antichrist, having great warships anchored in the Mediterranean, aiding his great strike against Israel, the Lord will break those ships and do so with an east wind, whatever that actually means. So we know God can do anything, right? So as far as the east wind that can decimate all these ships, God literally can breathe his nostrils. You know, like you go, God can breathe through his nostrils and send that wind from his nostrils that will destroy all the ships. It's just that easy. It's nothing to him. So, eight. As we have heard, so have we seen. In the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever, Selah. During the time of Hezekiah, Judah saw what the Lord could do. At the second coming, which will end in the battle of Armageddon, Israel will once again see what the Lord can do. And so will the entirety of the world. The entire world is going to see by camera. You know they're you know they're going to live they're going to live stream this on TV, internet. This like this, this just to even try to think about it is so mind blowing. But it's going to happen. You're going to have the world. It's going to be the most watched thing in the history of the world. Think about that. There are going to be people watching on TV, online, on their phones, tablets, computers, TVs. They're going to see Jesus Christ destroying the Antichrist and his army. <laughs> like, I'm just mind blown. It's going to happen. And I'm going to get a front row seat because I'm going to be with them. So... Join me. All right now, we have thought of your loving kindness, O God, in the midst of your temple. The writers referring to the times of prayer in the temple when the enemy was at the gate. According to your name, O God, so is your praise unto the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. God's action being ever in harmony with his character, his fame therefore extends and will extend to the very ends of the earth. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of your judgments. While Judah rejoiced at the great victory over Sinatra, still this pertains to the even greater victory over the coming Antichrist, of which the victory over Sinatra was a symbol. Walk about Zion <clears throat> and go round about her. Tell the towers thereof. And the idea is, peace now reigns because of the Prince of Peace now reigns. Yes, a little, a little, a little fact for you. Um. When Jesus was alive, um, the Romans had pretty much control over much of the civilized world, of course, and they would have gates, the war gates, you could call, the war gates, and they would open announcing that there was some war going on somewhere. During Jesus' time, when he was alive, a little interesting fact for you, those war gates were not open one time. There was not one war on earth when Jesus lived. Just a little fact for you. This just reminded me of that when the notes, the idea is peace now reigns because the Prince of Peace now reigns. So when Jesus was alive, there was not one war on earth. Think about that. That's the power. That's the power. Of Jesus. Just a little glimpse into the power of Jesus. That's why I say. Save people. Make a difference. In a country. Not to the degree of Jesus. Because Jesus was the son of God. Who was God in the form of man. But yet. An impact. That could be felt nonetheless. 
save people, make a difference in a community, in, in a neighborhood, in a state, in a country, in a continent. The more save people you have, the better. It, it makes a difference. All right. Mark you well with her bulwarks. Consider her palaces that you may tell it to the generation following. This psalm is sung in testimony of the great victory won by the Lord and the sending of his angel to defeat the Assyrians. And what should be told forever. And so it has been. And so it shall be. Here's the thing. I don't know why. The Bible isn't being made into into like the like the the books of the Bible. I don't know why they're not being made into movies. Because they would be the most exciting, thrilling movies ever. And they would be all true, true stories, real. Word for word. And it would be the most. The best movies ever made, period. And it would all be real. Why they don't do that, I, I just, even if, I, whatever. For this, God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. This psalm had its limitations when sung by Hezekiah. It will have no limitations when sung by the people of God at the beginning of the great millennial reign. Jesus Christ will then be our guide. Thank God, ultimately, there will be no more death. All right. So we'll start with those two chapters, um, take that in. And the millennial reign, the thousand year reign of Christ, you know the Lord's outline for prayer, thou shalt be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, when Jesus comes here for 1,000 years, it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And there ain't going to be no sin going on. So for 1,000 years, you're going to live his way. And that's a simple life. We know from the word of God that during this millennial reign, simple life. No one's going to make, no one's going to cook for you. No one's going to build your home. No one's going to do nothing for you. You're going to build your own shelter. You're going to farm your own land. And you're going to have a simple life. Very simple. Things will be completely different than they are now. So, I mean, the complete opposite of how life is now. When he comes, it's going to be the complete opposite. Because there's no, there's not going to be any rich people. No, there's not. There's not going to be people making money off poor people. There's not going to be people with slaves. Right now, just about... Every company, if not all companies, use the backs of poor people to make themselves rich. That's sin. When Jesus comes, that's not going to be happening. That's not going to happen. No one will be making money off the backs of the poor. So it's just going to be a simple life for people. Now, I'll be with Jesus, so... Um, I won't be living like that because I'll be in heaven and I'll come down here with him and I'll be doing something else. He'll have something else for me to do. But for people who are living during that time, um, that's how they'll be living. And the most incredible thing about it is after 1000 years of being with Jesus, the ma the majority of the world is going to side with the devil when he's released after 1,000 years. That is That just really tells you all you need to know about human beings. You want to know how wretched, no good and evil we can be? There's your example right there. The majority of the world is going to throw in with the, with the devil after 1,000 years. Because you know why? Because they're going to hate. They're going to hate Jesus' way. But they won't be able to do anything about it. They won't be allowed to. But they're going to hate it. And then once they get an opportunity to, to just join the devil, they will. That's really something, isn't it? All right. God bless you.